Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Uh, nice to see Alan here and uh, Jim and uh, Bill. Welcome, uh, Melly and uh, Edna and uh, everybody else. Wow, there's more people here today. I don't know if I'm so nervous now. I can't even speak. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you uh, bow down with me, please. Father in heaven, today we observe the resurrection of your son. It's a day that we celebrate. We call Easter Sunday, as well popularly known. It's the celebration of the rising of your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. And today we're going to look at scripture that we've seen so many times. And we ask that you help us to have a better understanding of, of the scripture that we're about to cover today. And more importantly, help me to deliver it so that all of us, including me, will learn, truly learn from it and, and uh, have a deeper understanding of what your resurrection is all about in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So knowing that today is Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, the, uh, I, I thought the appropriate scripture that I would talk about or cover is the first chapter of Corinthians or the first Corinthians chapter 15. And chapter 15 is a pretty long chapter, so I am only going to cover chapter 15, verse 1 to 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 28. And if anyone's looking for a title for this message, uh, I would call it the significance of Christ's resurrection. Significance of Christ's resurrection. But first of all, I... You know, I always like to give the background of, of the scripture of Corinthians, so to speak. Uh, Corinthians was written by, the first Corinthians was, was written by Paul. And most scholars believe that it was written somewhere between 53 to 55 AD. And that's only like 30 some years after Jesus Christ actually died and resurrected. And Paul wrote it, most, most of them believe he wrote it from Ephesus to the, the church in Corinth. And Corinth, if maybe some of you already know where Corinth is, is a city of Greece. And it's located, uh, okay, here's Greece, for example. Uh, this is Greece here. And then on the lower part of Greece is the peninsula of the Peloponnese. Peloponnese is a peninsula here, and there's a small isthmus, which is they call isthmus of Corinth. Corinth is right here. Let me see if, if I'm trying to look. Yeah, Corinth is right here. Athens is here. So it's about 48 miles away from Corinth. So this is the, Corinth, the Corinthian church that Paul was writing about. So you have to realize that these are mostly Greeks. It's a Greek city. I, I want to give this background so that you would know where Paul was coming from. And actually the first Corinthians, starting from the very first chapters, this church of Corinth, it's a pretty interesting church. Because, or a congregation, because they had, they had so many issues. And I'm, I don't plan on staying here for six hours to discuss all that stuff, so we're only going to cover chapter 15, verse 1 to 28, so that we'll only be here for like three hours instead of eight. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, he covered a lot of issues. And then, when we get to chapter 15, he said this, chapter 15, verse 1. He said, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the good news I preach to you. You received it and have put faith, your faith in it. He's saying, well, I'm reading from the New International Reader's Version. But the way this is said, actually, if you look at the Greek, it was, he put more emphasis. The other translation says, now I make known to you. I think NAS says, I make known to you as if they haven't heard it before. That what I am going to say, he saved 
the most important for last, I guess. He covered all the other issues. And then when he got to, to uh, chapter 15, well, we call it chap chapter 15 nowadays, but before it's not really divided into chapters. He says, brothers and sisters, I want you to know again the good news preached to you. You received it and you put your faith in it. In verse 2, he says, because you believe the good news, you are saved. Notice that because you believe what he, because Paul, you know, the people believe what Paul preached. He's saying you are saved. They are already saved because they believed. Then again, you have this small word, B-U-T. But, he said, you must hold firmly to the message I preach to you. There, you notice the condition? But you must hold firmly to the message I preach to you. If you don't, you have believed it for nothing. So there's some sort of a warning there. What I received, verse 3, I passed on to you, and it is the most important of all. Notice how he saved this, and he said, this is the more most important of all. Get it in your heads and in your being is what he's saying. And here is what it is, he said. Christ died for our sins. Just as scripture said he would, verse 4, he was buried and then he was raised from the dead on the third day just as scripture said he would be. See, if you read that, you won't catch it right away, but if you think about it, he focused on the body of Jesus Christ. The body which John talked about, where there was a Logos that existed with God at the same time, and the Logos became flesh, which is the body of Jesus Christ, and he, is, he became human being. And this is the one who died for our sins. It's that body that died for our sins. And it rose again from the dead. This very same body rose from the dead on the third day. Just as scripture said it would be. And what scripture was he talking about? There's a lot. Back then, you have to remember when, when Paul talks about scripture, it's the Old Testament. Because that's the only scripture available back then. I mean, the New Testament... This was just not even canonized as part of the New Testament. You know, he probably didn't even know that this is going to be part of the New Testament. So there are so many scriptures. One scripture like Psalm 16 verse 10. Or Isaiah 53. The whole chapter prophesying about Jesus Christ becoming flesh and dying for us. And so notice he was talking about the body of Jesus Christ that died on the cross. And it's the same body that raised, or was raised again on the third day. And he makes all these, uh, like a supporting documentation, or you might say supporting da data, to prove that he resurrected. You know, see, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, if you look at all, uh, a lot of the ancient religions, there's always been this God, a God dying and resurrecting. That's nothing new. But if you look at the, all other, the other religions, it's like a mystery. You know, this God dying and then it resurrected mysteriously and becomes like a tree or another form of being. And it's all mystery and nobody saw it. And, and, and here, Paul is saying he appeared to Peter. You have to remember the choices that, that Paul made here. He chose prominent people at that time. Peter was a leader of the church. He said he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 apostles. Remember this is only a generation after Jesus Christ actually died and rose. He said it's not a myth. It's not like a mystery like the other religions that you see there. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the 12 apostles. And then after that, verse 6, he appeared to more than 500 believers. So this is not like a mystery thing where, where 
Jesus Christ, you know, just kind of sort of mysteriously resurrected and uh, no one saw him. He was seen by Peter, the twelve, and five hundred people. Most of them are still living, but some have died. He appeared to James. So the thing that we don't know is, is this the James, the son of Alphaeus, or is it the James, the brother of Jesus? More importantly, I would think, my opinion is, he's probably talking about James, the brother of Jesus, because James at that time became the, the head of the Jerusalem church, the congregation over there. Then he appeared to all the apostles. Last of them all, verse 8, he also appeared to me. Well, this is Paul talking. I was like some who wasn't born at the right time in a normal way, and I'm the least important of the apostles, and I'm not even fit to be called an apostle. I tried to destroy the church. Here's another mystery. I mean, here's Paul who was trying to persecute the church. And it, it tells you the wisdom of God. He said, you know, you are the one that's trying to persecute the church. I'm going to use you, and you're going to declare me. And that's what he's doing now. See the power and wisdom of God. But there is a purpose why Paul is saying all these things. So whether it was I, or verse 10, because of God's grace, I am what I am, and his grace was not wasted in me. No, I have worked harder than all the other apostles, but I didn't do the work. Paul realizes because of his conversion that God's grace is the one that caused it. So whether, it, verse 11, so whether it was I or the other apostles who preached to you, that it was, that is what we preach, and that is what you believed. And then in verse 12, this is the reason why he made all these qualification uh, verses, because of verse 12. There was something happening in the church of Corinth that he needed to address this issue. In verse 12, he said, We have preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. So how can some of you say that no one rises from the dead? Obviously, back then, there were some already that were saying the dead will not rise. If you look at the word rises, it's the Greek word Anastasis. Anastasis meaning to stand up. And the dead here in Greek is nekros, which means corpse. So it means the rising of the corpses. Sounds kind of Walking Dead uh, episode, right? But this is what Paul is saying. How come some of you are saying the corpses will not rise? You have to understand, you know, some are saying that probably these were Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. That could be true, but you have to, make, you have to realize he was addressing probably Greeks. The Greeks were influenced by the philosophy of Plato. See, the afterlife is not something new. Plato already had an idea of some afterlife where there is a soul when that will leave the body and it will it's the it's the soul that will live forever and the body is left because the body is evil and so more possibly some of the corinthians are saying you know what maybe jesus christ is unique by himself where he resurrected but then for us it's already a spiritual resurrection where we will not have a bodily resurrection. Where we will just go somewhere and float as a spirit. You see? And it could be true. But then Paul is saying, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? Did you see what? Paul is saying here, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is tied to the resurrection of those who believe. Those that are in Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is tied to the resurrection of the dead. That is what 
we should learn from here. And he's saying, if no one rises, verse 13, if no one rises from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So if you don't believe that the anastasis of the neck cross is going to happen, then Jesus Christ is not even raised from the dead. You might as well say the resurrection did not happen. See, it's so easy to spiritualize the resurrection of the dead. It's so easy. We can just say, wow, it's just a spiritual thing where when I die, I'm resurrected already spiritually. But this is not what Paul is saying. It's true. What happens when somebody dies? Will his spirit go to heaven or will, is he still sleeping? I don't want to get into that because that involves a lot of speculation. There are indications that even in the Old Testament, the Israelites believed, see what the Israelites believed back then is that the people that died, their pneuma, which is the spirit, goes into some kind of shoal or a place and it stays there. Because if you read the book of Samuel where, or Saul, when Saul consulted the medium and he brought back the spirit of Samuel, you see, so they were talking about some kind of spirit. So even the Jews and the Israelites believe in some sort of a spirit. And, and, and in fact, in, when, in Luke, remember when, when Jesus Christ uh, rose from the dead after the, the road to Emmaus, he, he appeared to a few of the disciples in the road to Emmaus, Emmaus or whatever. And then he, he dined with them. And so those people went back to Jerusalem and then he told, they told the other disciples where, that they saw Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ suddenly appeared. And then they were afraid because they, saw, they thought they saw a ghost. And then Jesus Christ said, no, I'm not. Uh, this would have been the right opportunity for Jesus Christ to say, there's no such thing as a ghost. But he didn't say that. He said, I'm not a ghost, meaning I'm not a pneuma. Look at me. I have flesh and blood. I mean flesh and, and, and bones, not blood. I had flesh and bones. So this would have been an opportunity for Jesus Christ to say, no, there's no such thing as a, a pneuma or whatever. And then the same, and the same thing again, when, when they saw Jesus Christ, remember when he was walking on the water and the apostles thought that they saw a ghost? It's talking about a pneuma. So I don't discount a pneuma after death, or some are saying, you know, that they're just asleep. So I don't really want to get into that because it involves a lot of speculation. But what is Paul, what was for sure, what Paul is saying is there is a resurrection of the body. You see, Jesus Christ was the Logos, right? He was given a human body during the Incarnation. That body died to redeem us of our sins. That very same body resurrected. There's no one on the grave. And so when Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead, there's not going to be any body on the graves. So it could be true that the dead are somewhere, a uh, pneuma somewhere, with, in the heaven somewhere. But with these verses, it shows clearly that that's not the final destination of those that are under Christ. There is a resurrection of the body. See, each one of us were given a body unique to us when we were born. And this very same body is going to be the one that's going to be resurrected given the glorious body just like Jesus Christ. And that's when true eternal life happens. That's when eternal life happens. And so, verse 4, he was buried, he was raised from the dead the third day, as scripture said. In verse 6, after that, he appeared to James and all that. And then, 
so in verse 12 it says we have preached Christ and how come some of you are saying there's no resurrection from the dead so if no one rises from the dead then not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised what we preach doesn't mean anything your faith doesn't mean anything either. So what you're saying, what we're saying is, even if you believe Christ resurrected from the dead, that should tie in right away to your own resurrection from the dead. That should tie in right away. Otherwise, if you don't believe that, that you will rise from the dead when you die, that you will rise the way Jesus Christ did, what is Paul saying? Your faith doesn't mean anything. Your sins have not been forgiven. I mean, you could probably reread all these things. Those who have died believing in Christ are lost. If you minimize the resurrection of the dead. This is what we should have in our, in our heads when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what it means. Verse 19, do we have hope in Christ only in this life? Then people should pity us more than anyone else. In verse 20, he said, but Christ really has been raised from the dead. He's the first of all who will rise. He is the first of all who will rise. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is unique. He's spirit, of course, but there's something different from that glorified body. And the apostles witnessed it. They saw it. They saw him eat with them. And they saw him, they could feel him. It's not just like a pneuma thing where it's the spirit and it appears and disappears but he, they can't really feel him he can't really eat and it's like the ghost stories that we see in the movies where it's just like a spirit thing they saw it and this is why the Christian church grew this is why they were willing to die to be martyred because they witnessed the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ and they have seen what a resurrect the resurrected glorified body is all about and they said this is what I want this is my hope and so they spread the, the gospel in, in verse 22 because of Adam all people die so because of Christ all will be made alive all will be made alive and here's when will this be? Is it when, when we die, then we'll be made alive right away? Paul makes it clear. He doesn't make it vague. In verse 23, but there is an order of events. Christ is the first of those who rise from the dead. And then when he comes back, those who belong to him will be raised. So Jesus Christ was the first one. And then Paul talks about Jesus Christ coming back. And then that's when everyone else that are in him will have a resurrection just like Jesus Christ did. Resurrect. They will be resurrected in a glorified body. It's somewhat of a spirit where it can appear and disappear, but it's different where you, you can be felt if you wanted to. You can eat if you want to, because just like Jesus Christ did. He ate with them. Uh, they could feel his bones. They could feel the wounds. It's not a pneuma existence, where it's just purely spirit, where it kind of fades and they touch things, and it, it's like they can't even touch, you know, on the movies. Have you seen the spirit movies where they do this and it goes through? Like, they can't. But here, a resurrected body can appear and disappear, but it can also become solid, where you can touch it. And, then when, and so this is what Paul is talking about. There's an order of events. Christ is the first of those who rise from the dead, and when he comes back, those who belong to him. In verse 24, then the end will come. Christ will destroy all rule, 
authority and power. And he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ ushered his work of conquering death eventually. When he rose from the dead, he conquered death. But that's the initial, because he conquered death for his physical body. But eventually, for everyone, death will be conquered. And how can that death be conquered? People will come alive that are in him, and there will be no one in the graves. See, now when people die, we say that while he's in heaven resting peacefully, but there's still the stigma of death. Why? Because if you go to the cemetery, you know that there are bones in there. I mean, I, I've witnessed a body that's been exhumed. I think I was only in high school with my uncle. We had to dig him up. There were some issues. And I've seen how it looked like. I've also witnessed a cremation. When my cousin died like five years ago, he just died right in front of me. We were playing tennis and then I had to help out the family. And, and, and I saw the coffin just go in there. And I mean, it's only like halfway and the, the fire just consumed it. And, but you know that the body, the body, the flesh is still there and, and it's all ashes now and, and the people that died, there are bones in there. But we talk about, okay, they're living peacefully in heaven now and it's true, it could be true. But that's not their final destination. There is a resurrection of the dead coming. When he, uh, so didn't it say here? Verse 23, but there's an order of events. Christ is the first of those who rise from the dead. When he comes back, those who belong to him will be raised. And then verse 24, then the end will come. Christ will destroy all rule, all authority and power. And he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. But, you know, verse 25, Christ must rule until he has put all his enemies under his control. And verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. See, when he resurrected, he ushered in his work of destroying death. And then when he comes back, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Paul confirmed this again in, in Philippians 3, verse 8 to 11. He, he himself confirmed this. Philippians 3, verse 8 to 11, he said, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. See, that was his hope. And that's what sh our hope should be. That's what our hope should be. You know what your future is if you are in Christ? Just read the Gospels of how he was when he was glorified. His body that was glorified. The things he did. Because he, he didn't go out in a mystery. He stayed here for several days on earth. 500 people, more than that, witnessed him, touched him. And when they saw it, he said, that's my hope. I'm willing to be martyred for that hope. And that should be our hope. Not some numa existence floating out somewhere, which could be, I mean, it's okay. But that's not the ultimate hope of everyone that is in Christ. And that's what should stick in our minds when we say, Christ has risen. He ushered in his work of putting death out of existence. No more bodies in those graves. Amen?